Um, so let me try to update you on Zika virus as uh, information is flowing through. Um, so just some information on the work I'm doing which may influence what I discuss. So um, I'm working predominantly on the adult manifestations of Zika virus and I'll explain what those are um, and have worked with the WHO on guideline development. Um, there's um, a Medscape consult site which is actually a healthcare provider site and I'm the chief editor for Zika viruses on that. And I receive funding support through the NIH, but it's not on Zika because Congress hasn't funded anything. <laughs> so, so, um, so some key facts about Zika virus. So the primary mode of transmission that, uh, that is the most frequent, um, at least now, is, uh, is via mosquito-borne vectors, predominantly the Aedes mosquitoes. So there are various species of mosquitoes. Um, the Aedes mosquito is the um, most common mosquito uh, that's been identified to transmit Zika virus. Uh, important to know that they're not just mosquitoes that come in at night, so that's kind of the, I think, uh, what we think of as mosquitoes oftentimes are kind of almost that, you know, we have to wear a bed net and they're going to bite us at night. These are aggressive daytime feeders as well, so people have to be cautious during the day and the nighttime. Um, they breed very voraciously in water holding containers, so one thing that people should be aware of is uh, we're getting into the summer months and as you're traveling is not to leave kind of uh, water just lying around because mosquitoes will breed in those areas. Um, they also transmit these mosquitoes, chikungunya and dengue virus, so those are other viruses that can cause um, effects uh, in the body. Um, and actually can be very similar in terms of presentation. Uh, and so it can be challenging from a clinical perspective to diagnose those. Um, importantly, actually, just the other day, a study came out that there's another mosquito type that is actually associated with um, transmitting Zika virus, and this is actually much more widespread, the Culex mosquito. So that's a concern because we're c that has just a very widespread in terms of its international presence as a mosquito vector. So we talked about mosquito bites um, being a risk factor for uh, acquiring Zika virus infection. The other mode of transmission that um, everyone should be aware of is um, from mother to child. So uh, during pregnancy, there's a risk that the fetus uh, will have Zika virus or the consequences of Zika virus infection. Uh, sexual contact is uh, another mode of transmission. And then um, blood transfusion uh, in the laboratory as well as organ transplantation are also modes of transmission of the virus. Um, so we talked about this uh, a little bit. Um, in terms of uh, our risk for mosquito-borne uh, infections in the United States, there's definitely a risk. We know that um, it will, or it already has, actually hit the United States. Um, both ID species, so the two different types of ID mosquitoes, are present in the United States. So these are maps um, of the distribution of the mosquito vectors, so the mosquitoes that actually transmit Zika virus. And so, um, I mean, you can see here that we have some risk in, in this area, but really predominantly in the southeast region of the country, um, which is, is going to have an outbreak of Zika virus. Which no doubt that it will. So, and I think that just the point is that this this type of mosquito, this map here on the left, that is actually the most strongly associated with transmission of the virus. This is much more or less so, but I mean, still, we know that it will transmit the virus. This is just another map showing um, kind of some of the hot spots where uh, Zika will be in the United States, and so you can see here these kind of dark red colors um, are where we know Zika will hit the hardest based on what we know about the mosquitoes. So um, so I'm going to talk about some of the other modes of transmission now, okay, other than mosquitoes. So mother to child transmission. So, um, and I want to bring home some important uh, messages that I hope you'll share with other members of, of your community and friends, family, etc you know, whether they be here in, in New York or other parts of the country or international. So um, one is that a pregnant woman can pass Zika onto her fetus, and uh, Zika is the cause of microcephaly or small head sizes and other congenital birth defects that can be very severe. Um, so the breastfeeding issues, so um, uh, in breast milk, uh, Zika has been found, okay, but there's been no cases of um, babies acquiring Zika infection in the setting of breastfeeding. 
So right now, the current recommendations are to continue breastfeeding given the benefits of breastfeeding for the overall health of the baby, and to continue that in a Zika endemic region or if you've traveled there. So it shouldn't um, preclude anyone from breastfeeding their child. So this is important recommendations right now. So w women who are living in areas with Zika, okay, so we'll talk about where Zika is in a minute, but you know, Central America, South America, um, portions now of Western Africa, um, they should wait at least eight weeks after Zika virus infection symptoms start before trying to get pregnant. Um, I'll talk a little bit about um, male to female uh, sexual transmission, but if the male partner has had Zika virus infection, they should wait at least six months, okay, before symptoms start, uh, after his symptoms start, before trying to get pregnant. And the biggest recommendation right now is if you're, if you're pregnant or you're trying to get pregnant, you should not, you should avoid traveling to any Zika endemic region, okay? The risk is just, uh, we think, high enough to say do not travel to those areas. Um, so what about sexual transmission? So this is the other message I really want you to take home and spread. I think um, there's a lot of um, lack of information and misinformation regarding the um, sexual transmission of the virus. So um, we know that men are able to, and women now, but men I'll focus on first, men are able to transmit the virus um, to a female partner, male partner, any other partner, um, and and has evidence of the virus actually in their semen for a prolonged period of time. And so that's where the six month recommendation comes from because we know it lasts in the semen for at least a couple of months and so that's why waiting for that amount of time is very important. Um, there was just a case actually in New York City that described a woman transmitting it to a male. Um, and so this is the first case that we know of of a female transmitting to a male. Um, it's, you know, consistent with what we know about other viruses, specifically HIV, um, but, uh, but this is now evidence that that, uh, that is a potential mechanism for developing the infection. So in terms of how you can protect yourself, so, you know, obviously wearing condoms is going to be essential. Abstaining from sex is the best way to avoid the infection. So those things have to be a message that, um, especially I think in this community where you know people are traveling back and forth so much uh, to places like the Dominican Republic, Puerto Rico, we're seeing so many people not be aware that sexual transmission is a major issue and actually getting very serious infections from Zika virus because of this. So I really want to raise awareness about that. So I'll just briefly go through this. I mean, there's some evidence to suggest, and I, you know, again, knowing about other viruses, we know that it's likely that it can be transmitted uh, via blood transfusions. There's evidence from um, the early outbreak in the Pacific Islands in an area uh, called French Polynesia where um, some of the serious manifestations we saw in Zika first kind of start there. Um, we know that there was a certain percentage, a low percentage, but a certain percentage of patients who developed Zika virus from blood transfusions. So now there's a lot of emphasis on, on the safety of blood transfusions and how we're going to develop that safety. That's really on the medical end, though. But you should be aware of that if you're, you know, you need a blood transfusion, if you have a family member that receives a blood transfusion, just um, uh, be aware of it. Make sure that they're screening the blood, where it's come from. Ask, you know, these questions and. Make sure your healthcare provider is also providing that information. So um, another challenge is um, how many people have heard about the case in Utah? Okay. So um, so there was a patient that uh, had traveled, gotten a, a serious Zika virus infection, died. We don't know if they died from Zika or, or something else, and we don't have much details on that patient but someone who was associated with the family of the patient. Okay, so this is an important case that everyone should be aware of because, so this patient traveled, got Zika virus, okay, was very sick, otherwise died. Then, he transmitted the virus, not, he didn't have sex, there was no travel in this individual, we do not know how this person developed Zika virus. What we do know, is that the person that was taking care of the patient that died had a very, very high level of the virus in their blood, extraordinarily high.
the reason for that, how that happened, were, you know, not me, but the, you know, these big organizations are studying it. So it's concerning, right? We have found Zika virus in the saliva. Um, it's in the urine. So the question is whether he, ha you know, it was bodily fluid, essentially. So just to kind of talk about where Zika is right now. So um, actually, Zika was discovered in the 1940s. There haven't been any outbreaks of Zika until this current kind of outbreak really started in 2007 in the South Pacific and then went through the islands of the South Pacific and then got over into Brazil and has spread since. So that's kind of the pattern of what we're seeing now. Um, so um, so this is a map of the, of the spread, essentially, of the... Um, of the virus across um, countries around the world. So um, so you can see after Brazil, it kind of travels up into Central America, has gone over into Cape Verde, and now um, we're concerned about Western Africa as well. Okay. So how many countries right now? So there's, um, as of July 13th, um, there's 65 countries and territories that have reported mosquito-borne uh, Zika virus transmission since 2007. And most of these countries, 62, have reported it since 2015. So you can see this map of just kind of the rapid acceleration of countries that have Zika virus. Right. So this is just another map showing um, the regions affected. Um, so this map is uh, essentially based on um, where we know the mosquitoes are and the areas at risk for um, endemic Zika virus transmission based on the mosquitoes. So what about here in the United States? So as of the 20th of July, um, there's 1,400, 1,403 cases that are travel associated. Um, there are 15 sexually transmitted cases. Um, Florida health officials, as of last week, are investigating two locally acquired cases, which are probably real. Um, and so we're going to see more and more, I think, endemic cases specifically in that region. Um, what about here in United in, the, in, in New York City? So um, we have the most cases actually in the country of travel associated Zika infection, even more than Florida. Last week, the health department uh, announced, or maybe a couple days ago now, the health department announced that um, there was the first case of um, uh, microcephaly, so a small head and a baby that was born in the city um, of a mother that traveled. So this area, Washington Heights and the Bronx, are the highest portion of patients within Manhattan that have infections. So there was an article that was published in the New York Times, I believe, that um, shows that the Dominican Republic population is the highest uh, population, immigrant population, to have Zika virus infections that are travel associated in the United States. It, it accounts for more than a fifth of cases, so pretty dramatic um, a number. Um, in Dominican Republic right now, um, there's a huge explosion of Zika virus. Um, and I'm studying the neurological effects there, but we're seeing a lot of um, very severe cases, unfortunately. These numbers are actually old. It's, uh, it's a lot more than that, but you can kind of get a sense. This is from, I think, two or three weeks ago. So there's over 2,000 suspected cases, over 200 pregnant women, and over 100 neurological cases. OK. so. Um, to the meat of this. So <laughs> what are the symptoms and signs of Zika virus that you need to worry about, okay? So um, one is to know is that many people who have Zika virus have no symptoms at all or will just have very mild symptoms that will uh, improve on their own. Um, the period of time between, uh, you know, the bite or the sexual contact is typically about, um, you know, one to two weeks. Um, in which you'll then develop symptoms. The most common symptoms are very nonspecific, so fever, a rash, feeling a lot of joint pain, um, inflammation of the eye, so you can see that in the picture here. And then it usually lasts for up to about a week, and then will go away. So here are just some more pictures. So, um, sorry, these are, so this is the red eye, the rash that you can develop. So, I mean, one thing I w want to emphasize to you is if you have been to an area or your partner has been to an area and you develop a rash and you think, ah, oh, nothing, whatever, I have a little bit of joint pain, it, absolutely not. You need to come to the hospital, we need to evaluate you, we need to follow this. Okay, so why are, why are we taking this so seriously? Um, I mean, besides the fact that this is a new infection and we need to know about, uh, about it, 
we know that there's very serious consequences potentially in patients. So in a smaller number of patients um, that may have symptoms, may not have symptoms, that are kind of flu-like, there are potential very serious consequences. So many of you know about the small head, but there's other birth defects, as I mentioned. And in adults, there's this syndrome, which is something that I'm studying, called Guillain-Barre syndrome. And why is Guillain-Barre syndrome so serious? So Guillain-Barre syndrome is a condition in which you have a rapidly, typically ascending weakness um, and sometimes some tingling that can actually affect your respiratory muscles, so your breathing, and you can actually, uh, you may have failure of breathing and you need to have a tube in your mouth. About 5% of patients can die or will die. Um, we're seeing actually double that number in the Dominican Republic, which is very concerning. Um, we know how to manage this condition, um, but we, we need people to come in early. We need them to be aware of it. So again, if you have you know, a little tingling in your feet and you're not really able to open your hands as well as you used to, you need to come to the hospital right away because that may change very rapidly and we need to treat you. So. Um, not to complicate things, but um, there are other um, neurological complications, so complications related to brain inflammation, uh, inflammation of the spinal cord that can lead to very serious consequences that have been found in Zika virus infection as well. This isn't surprising because there's many infections that can cause really a widespread uh, spectrum in terms of manifestations that we see. Um, but we're studying this now, and so I'm working with colleagues uh, predominantly in Colombia and then other places in the United States and Puerto Rico to understand kind of what we, what we see with Zika virus infection. And so uh, at Colombia, what we're doing now, we had actually, uh, you know, in a service where we take care of maybe 10, 15 patients a day, we actually had six patients the, during last week that we were very suspicious that they had Zika virus. And so the city was wanted testing, we tested them. Um, one was primarily through sexual transmission. Um, and so we, we are very aware of it. Um, we are studying it very closely, we're following it very closely along with, uh, of course, the women who are pregnant and the babies. Okay, so what about um, birth defects? So um, Zika virus infection has been um, seen in all trimesters to be associated with fetal abnormalities. The most serious sequelae occur during the first and second trimester. Um, the effects on the fetus have been seen both in those patients who are symptomatic with the fever, chills, rash, um, and those who don't have any symptoms. Um, so that's concerning. There's a much higher percentage of patients who have uh, abnormal uh, fetuses with those who have symptoms, you think that they just have a higher amount of virus, but it is seen in those without symptoms. Um, we don't know the rate of transmission um, from the mother to the fetus. Um, we know that it can cross the placenta, so the barrier between you know, the mother and the baby, and it can affect um, the nerve cells, uh, unfortunately in a, in a very serious and uh, devastating way often. So, um, so many of you, I'm sure, have, have heard about microcephaly. It's a, um, a condition in, the, in which a baby is born with a very small head um, compared with other babies the same age and uh, sex. Um, there's been other um, abnormalities, including eye, eye problems, hearing loss, um, other um, neurological effects, problems growing that may occur. We also know that there's um, loss of the fetus. Um, I think there's um, uh, a number of spontaneous abortions that have occurred in the context of Zika virus infection. Um, so now um, we have identified um, microcephaly, the small head, and other birth defects in 13 countries. Uh, 15 countries have found this condition that can lead to the loss of breathing, Guillain-Barre syndrome. And we know, we know that we have proven scientifically that Zika virus is associated with these conditions. Um, so now, uh, this is the registry um, in the United States. Um, there are 12 um, births um, that have defects associated with Zika virus, six um, pregnancy losses with birth defects, um, and then this is uh, in the United States. So this is actually um, 
in the U.S. and the District of Columbia. So you can see those numbers right there. They're going to rise pretty dramatically, I think, in the next month. So what do we not know? Um, unfortunately, a lot. So um, if, a, if a pregnant woman is exposed, we don't know how likely she is to get Zika virus. Um, if she's infected, um, we don't know how the virus will affect her pregnancy. We don't know how likely it is that Zika will pass on to her fetus. We don't know if the fetus is infected, whether it will develop um, birth defects. Um, we don't know when in pregnancy uh, the infection might cause harm to the fetus, although we know that you know severe, severe manifestations usually are occurring in the first and second trimester. Um, and we don't know if sexual transmission poses a different risk, uh, which is a major question right now. Um, so while, uh, so let's just talk about what people should do now. So while women are pregnant, as we mentioned, avoid travel to an area with Zika virus, um, take steps to prevent mosquito bites, um, take steps that we've discussed to prevent getting Zika through sex, um, see a doctor or healthcare provider if you have traveled um, to a country with Zika virus and talk to your healthcare provider. Um, it's especially important for pregnant women if you develop any symptoms to uh, see your doctor within two weeks, ideally as soon as possible, um, to be tested for the infection. And then, you know, now we're having very serious monitoring of these women so that you'll need to be monitored very closely uh, if you do become pregnant and you have had evidence of uh, the infection. So what about the Olympics? I um, figured someone would ask me, so before you ask me, I'm just going to give you the information. So for women who are pregnant, uh, the recommendation is to not go to the Olympics. Um, if you must go, um, you should talk to your doctor or other health care provider first and strictly follow um, steps to prevent mosquito bites, use condoms. Um, in a male partner who goes to the Olympics, um, uh, uh, they should either use condoms uh, or don't have sex during the pregnancy. Um, for those of uh, those women who are trying to become pregnant, um, you should talk to your doctor. Um, every week things are changing in terms of CDC guidance of how long someone should wait to try to become pregnant and so I would update yourself. I'll give you at the end of the slides and I think on some of your materials you have the information as well. Um, of how to get to the website and look and see how long you're supposed to wait. Um, so those are the, really the main. Um, so to your question, how do you diagnose it? So um, if you uh, have traveled and you develop any symptoms, you should go to your doctor right away. Um, diagnosis is based on uh, the patient's travel history, symptoms, um, and test results. Typically a blood and urine test will be performed. Um, depending on the timing, so one issue that uh, we're dealing with is that uh, if you present within one to two weeks after your infection, typically you're still in the phase where the, you can detect the virus pretty easily. After that time, when we see a lot of neurological patients, um, it's very hard to differentiate the virus from other viruses like chikungunya, dengue, and so we have special tests now that can do that. And so what we do is we send the blood, we send the urine, um, to the city health department, they run the testing, and will let us know. So there were, a, there are, and there were a lot of myths about um, Zika virus, um, and you know, one of the first places that we need to start with is understanding why people have these thoughts, and is it a kind of a self-protective measure? Is it a societal issue? Um, is it a denial? Is it just because a generational gap? You know, there's many potential reasons. Um, stigma associated with women, you know, developing this. And um, so there, these are some of the myths. So some of them were, I mean, most of them are based on why children, why the babies are being born with small heads and these congenital birth defects. Because no one wanted to believe, we didn't want to believe as physicians that it was a mosquito that could cause this, right? This is the first time a mosquito bite can actually lead to these congenital birth defects, right? We have other viruses that can cause that, but that was such a dramatic thing. So one is that there's these genetically modified mosquitoes that essentially protect actually against multiple um, types of viruses. And there was a very widespread myth in uh, Brazil where this was centered 
that these were the cause of Zika virus infection. Absolutely not true. The next myth that came about was that there was this larvicide that was being used and that that was the cause of Zika virus. Then there was another myth with regard to vaccines. So um, there's been a lot of issues in terms of uh, women having their children get vaccines in uh, Zika endemic regions. So the other concern is now we're going to see a spike of rubella and measles and all these things that we once were protected against because people are now associating with Zika virus with these vaccines. Absolutely not true. And, you know, I mean, we know, scientifically, we know, and I want you to spread this around, that Zika virus is the cause of these issues. And, um, I mean, that's it, really. I mean, that we need to just emphasize that. So, you know, I think right now the two things that we emphasize in terms of um, in terms of what to do if you're if you get Zika virus is you know or before you travel to these places um, or have sexual contact is prevention. So um, there's a list of you know this is making sure that you wear long sleeve clothes when you can. Although I don't think that's very realistic in these hot places, <laughs> but I think it's something that's important. Using bed nets. Um, putting on mosquito repellent, um, safe sex practices as we know, okay? So all of those are incredibly important. Um, in terms of treatment, so there's no vaccine, there's no medication. So we have some medications that will fight viruses. We don't have one for Zika virus. In terms of whether, when you get these symptoms, so when you get a rash, flu-like symptoms, um, what should you do? So get plenty, see your doctor right away. Um, but in addition to that, you need to get plenty of rest, drink lots of fluids, you know, treat yourself with Tylenol to decrease the, um, the fevers. You shouldn't take um, anti-inflammatory medications or aspirin because of the bleeding risk. So that's something important that a lot of people don't know about. Um, if you're taking any medicines for another medical condition, you need to talk to your health care provider as well. So this is just some information about protecting yourself again. Um, and then these are the websites, so um, we can make sure that we have access to these for you. Um, these are the city health website, the CDC, um, Pan American Health Organization. So I would go to these intermittently at least once a week. And just um, there's buttons on all of them for patients and um, for those traveling, for pregnant women. They're constantly updated. So I think the city's doing a good job in terms of. Um, maybe not educating people, but I think they're doing a good job in terms of developing materials, working on testing. Um, still work is needed, but here are some resources.